All right, so this is the final lecture for chapter four, and in this lecture we're gonna be covering the anatomy of the rectum and the anal canal. So the rectum, it's a segment of the large intestine that's located in the posterior aspect of the pelvis, and it extends from the sigmoid colon um, down to the anal canal. So you have that kind of the terminal portion of the GI tract, you know, the sigmoid colon here, <clears throat> and then you, from that you have the rectum which, stretch, which stretches beyond that down into the pelvis and then forms the final anal canal here. And we'll go through this in more detail in subsequent slides. So it begins at the S3 level, vertebral level, and it courses inferiorly via two curvatures. So you can see the first curvature here along the sacrum, and that's called the sacral flexure, and it follows the curve of the sacrum and the coccyx, and it's called can concave anterior, is how you would describe the curve. The other f uh, flexure is the anorectal flexure, so it's, uh, which is here, indicated in the blue, and that's convex anterior, and that's formed by the tone of the puborecto rectalis muscle, which compresses here, like we talked about in the perineal lectures, and helps form that tone in the rectum to regulate passage of stool. St so stool accumulates in the terminal segment of the rectum called the ampulla, so that's in this region here, so this is your ampulla. And another thing I should point out here is the peritoneum covers the anterior superior two-thirds. So as you can see here, the, the peritoneum here is draping down. And it also covers the lateral part of the upper one-third of the uh, rectum. And another thing I should point out here is the peritoneum covers the anterior superior two-thirds. So as you can see here, the, the peritoneum here is draping down. And it also covers the lateral part of the upper one-third of the uh, rectum. And the venous drainage is via the superior, middle, and inferior rectal veins. And we're going to go into a little more detail about the venous drainage for the rectum because it has some clinical significance. Um, so you have the middle and inferior rectal veins. So that's this here, the medial hemorrhoidal, same thing as the middle, middle uh, rectal, inferior rectal. And these two both drain via the systemic circulation. And so that makes sense because they go, the middle goes to the internal iliac and then the inferior goes to the internal pudendal, which are both end up in the iliac veins and then into this uh, inferior vena cava. Now, what's important to note here is the superior hemorrhoidal, also known as the superior rectal. That drains into the portal circulation via the IMV. So it goes into the IMV, which is the inferior mesenteric vein. And the inferior mesenteric vein joins the splenic vein to form the portal vein. And so that goes into the portal venous system. And just to finish this out, uh, an important clinical significance, and this is something, again, that's very high yield on board exams. We talked about this in the abdominal lecture as well, is the, these portocaval anastomoses. Um, and so you have the middle inferior rectal veins um, forming anastomoses with the superior uh, rectal vein. And that's so that if there's, and that's relevant if there's portal hypertension, so if there's backup of pressure, um, back into the superior hemorrhoidal vein, it'll, it'll shift the venous drainage into the uh, middle and inferior uh, rectal veins and then go into the systemic circulation. The nervous innervation of the rectum, uh, its sympathetic innervation is via the superior and inferior hypogastric plexuses. Um, the parasympathetic is via the pelvic splanchnic nerves and then also via the inferior hypogastric plexus. And then the visceral afferent fibers, they follow the parasympathetic uh, supply. The lymph drainage is, um, so there's two different uh, lymph drainage systems involved with the rectum. Um, it can drain to the pararectal lymph nodes, which are just proximal to the rectum, and then those drain, so those would be down in, in this region here, and then they drain through vessels up here to the inferior mesenteric lymph nodes. And then you also have lymph from the inferior aspect of the rectum that drains directly into these internal iliac nodes here. So internal iliac in this region here. So it can either go this way or this way. So one of two ways. Now, some clinical applications. Rectal cancer it develops from the epithelial cells of the lumen, and you diagnose it via colonoscopy, just like you would with any other um, lower GI uh, malignancy. And due to the anatomical loca location of rectal cancer, its metastases can ca cause a variety of clinical findings, and we're going to go through each of those. 
and then in this slide and the subsequent slides. Now, initially you can have lymphatic spread, and it'll spread via those lymphatic vessels we, we talked about. So if you have these uh, lymph nodes down here by the rectum, it can go up to the inferior mesenteric nodes, or it can go to, if it's more in the inferior aspect, closer to the anal canal, it can go to these internal iliac nodes here. Um, if it, it can metastasize to the liver via the superior rectal vein, so superior hemorrhoidal rectal vein, same thing. So if it travels via the uh, hematogenously via the superior rectal vein, it can go and spread to the liver. Uh, it can penetrate posteriorly. So if you look at the rectum here, if it if it's kind of cut off here, but if it were to, you know extending back up here, it can go into the sacral plexus here. These this network of nerves, and that can cause a sciatic like pain because the sciatic nerve comes right off this. So it can mimic symptoms of sciatica. Uh, if you look at this from a superior view, down into the pelvis, um, you have the rectum coming down into here this way, just uh, posterior to the uterus. And what can happen here, both in males and females, is it can invade laterally into the ureter, which is kind of outlined here. And if it invades into the ureter, it will uh, lead to urinary problems. Uh, you can also, in the females, if it invades anteriorly, so if you look at this spatial relationship, here's the rectum here, it can invade into the uterus, it can invade into the cervix, um, it can invade into the vagina, because these structures are just anterior to the rectum. In males, so if we look at it here, here's the rectum, it can invade anterior into the prostate here, um, and then it can also, since in the males the bladder is directly anterior to the rectum, it can also invade into the bladder. The anal canal is the terminal segment of the GI tract, and it lies below the pelvic diaphragm, and it extends from the rectum to the anus. It's divided uh, by two lines by the pectinate line, which we'll talk about in subsequent slides. So internally, the anal canal has uh, these longitudinal folds of mucosa called anal columns, which are shown here, and they're stacked right next to each other. And they all end down here at this horizontal uh, border called the pectinate line, which I'm drawing in here with my blue pen. And at the most inferior end of these uh, longitudinal folds is you have the, these crescent-shaped uh, folds of mucosa, which are called the anal valves. So you can see those here. And at the, in, at the end of these uh, longitudinal spaces, kind of it, within these columns, is what's called the anal uh, sinuses, and they're, they're these mucosal pouches. And sometimes stool can get caught in there. So just to further draw this, so you have the columns here. So you have your column. And then you have this crescent-shaped fold down here called your valve. And then below that, you have your pouch. And so the valve could be thought of as almost the brim of the pouch. And so you have this pouch down here, which kind of marks the terminal end of the space within these longitudinal spa uh, spaces. Uh, the pectinate line, again, we'll draw that in here. And it kind of marks, it's, it, it's an area um, that's kind of formed during development. And it's an area of the anal canal where um, above and below have separate embryological origins and which come fused together during uh, development to form the entire anal canal. So, and this is very significant for a number of uh, different anatomical characteristics and even clinically. So, um, and we'll have, we have this nice table here that kind of goes through those different characteristics. So we have above the pectinate line, below the pectinate line. And so we'll draw it in here. And so if we go above the line, the embryological origin is the um, is the hindgut, and then if we go the below the line here, that's the ectoderm, and specifically the ectoderm of the proctodium. So two different embryological origins. Uh, if you go by uh, histolo histology of the mucosa, so again we draw our pectinate line here. The epithelium up here we kind of have this simple. Uh, columnar epithelium just like the rest of the GI tract. Um, below the pectinate line we have this, it's kind of as you get closer to the uh, anal orifice here uh, near the skin you start to have this more uh, non-keratinized squamous epithelium so you have um, sim the stra uh, squ squamous epithelium like this non-keratinized. If you get with the blood supply again we draw our line in here 
you have your uh, superior rectal, which does above the pe uh, pectinate line. And then below the pectinate line is actually the inferior rectal. And that's the same for the venous drainage. Um, so for the venous drainage above, you have the superior rectal vein, and then below you have the inferior rectal vein. So you can keep that straight. It's just the, the arteries and the veins, same name. Uh, for lymphatics, above the pectinate line, so we draw our line in here. Um, above, these are going to go to the uh, internal iliac lymph nodes. And if you're below the pectinate line, these are going to go to the superficial uh, inguinal lymph nodes, so more in the groin area. And this is important clinically because if you have a cancer in the anal region, if it's above the pectinate line, if it metastasizes lymphatically, it's going to go, you're going to find the met in the internal iliac lymph nodes. If it's below the pectinate line, it's going to metastasize to the superficial inguinal lymph nodes. So if on a test question they indicate, oh, it's an anal cancer, it was found distal, or it was found uh, beyond the, the pectinate line, then, and they ask where it spreads, then you would say internal iliac lymph nodes. So nervous innervation, again, we draw a line in here, and this is uh, very important clinically. So above, so above the pectinate line, you have ANS, so visceral um, pain fibers, and those go to your inferior hypogastric plexus. Um, below, you have somatic innervation, and that's uh, via the pudendal nerve. And this is important because somatic is more, uh, the pain's more low, uh, specific. Um, hemorrhoids and other lesions in this area are much more painful than if they're above the pectinate line. Um, and we'll talk about hemorrhoids a little bit more in subsequent slides. So just to finish out the anatomy here, the it contains two sphincters that kind of regulate the expulsion of stool, it's very similar to the um, uh, urethra, which has two uh, sphincters as well. So you have the internal sphincter and then the external sphincter. Uh, the the th it's the internal sph anal sphincter is a circular, smooth muscle, and it's in the inferior rectum and it's under ANS control. Um, so we do not consciously have control of this sphincter. The external anal sphincter is a skeletal muscle and it encircles the lower two-thirds. It actually blends with that puborectalis muscle uh, in the perineum and, under, and it's under somatic control. So this is the one where if you have the urge to have a bowel movement, you can kind of consciously control when uh, is the appropriate time to use the bathroom be, by uh, controlling this external anal sphincter. Uh, some clinical applications, so everybody's favorite exam, the digital rectal exam. It's clinically useful because, really because the rectum has is in, has uh, so many significant spatial relationships to uh, several pelvic structures, both in males and females. Um, it's Even though everyone thinks of it using used for prostate cancer in males, it's also used in females as well. Um, and if you look, in males it's used because you have the prostate right here, which is just anterior to the rectum. So if an examiner can palpate in this area here, um, if there's a tumor here, and typically pro prostate cancer tum cancerous tumors will develop in the posterior lobes of the prostate and kind of extend in. And so the prostate, instead of feeling uh, soft, the examiner will notice that it's, there's a lesion in there and it um, has more of a hard uh, texture to it. And that's more alarming for a cancer than if they were just palpated and it's a soft uh, prostate. BPH, benign prostatic hyperplasia, which is a benign condition, that more uh, develops in the center of the prostate around the urethra. We'll talk more about those conditions in more detail in the male reproductive lectures. In females, so if you look here, this is where the rectum is. If you notice, uh, same thing, what the structures that are anterior in the female is the cervix here. So it can help for uh, low, uh, palpating lesions in the cervix. Also, uh, the lower part of the uterus is here. And then you can also palpate the pouch of Douglas, which is this region down here formed by this fold of peritoneum. And that can be useful because often endometri endometriosis can develop in there. Um, you can also have cancerous lesions in there. 
So it's important to also palpate that area in the female. You can also, and then you can also use the digital rectal exam to examine for hemorrhoids as well. So speaking of hemorrhoids, let's talk about. So actually, hemorrhoids, even though we always talk about them as a as a disease or a pathological process, they're actually normal vascular structures that are in the anal canal. So if you look here on this, the, it's indicated here on this kind of side section of the anal mucosa. And so these are normal vascular structures that are in everyone. And they function to help with defecation, but they can become uh, disease when they're swollen or inflamed. And that's when we have those bulging lesions called um, internal and external hemorrhoids. Now, what causes these to become uh, swollen or inflamed? Well, it's usually a result of either constipation, conditions that cause prolonged increases in abdominal pressure, such as straining while defecation, during defecation, prolonged standing. Um, all of these can lead to kind of stressing the, these hemorrhoid vascular structures and causing them to become swollen and inflamed. Now, you have two types. You have internal hemorrhoids and external hemorrhoids. And again, here, that pectinate line comes into play. So I'll draw this right here. And what's important to know about that is internal is internal hemorrhoids are above the pectinate line. And then the external hemorrhoids are below the pectinate line. And what's important to know is since these internal hemorrhoids are above that pectinate line, so they're above the pectinate, they're usually not painful because the pain sensation in this area is controlled by autonomic fibers. And if you remember, the pain sensation by autonomic fibers, it's a little less specific. Um, it's not as quite as a sharp, well-demarcated pain versus external hemorrhoids, which occur below the pectinate line. These are very, very painful. And the reason for that is you have the pen, the it, when you get below here, this is all somatic innervation, um, which is carried by the pudendal nerve. And so these are typically very, very painful. An internal hemorrhoid can, be, can become, if it progresses, very painful. And the way it does that is, let's say we have a hemorrhoid up here like this. If it grows and, and uh, prolapses down through the anal canal into this external region, then it can stimulate these somatic fibers and become extremely painful. And often these have to be uh, surgically treated. Just to finish out here, the, uh, go through the process of defecation. So the stool collects in the ampulla of the rectum, and so that's in this region right here. So this is your ampulla. And so what happens here is, it dis is the ampulla is able to accommodate stool over time, but it, and so it causes distension. And the distension is kind of sensed by visceral afferents. And then when it reaches a point, um, it becomes you know a, f a fullness the autonomic uh, nervous system senses that. And what happens when it's time to defecate, for defecation to occur is the puborectalis muscle, it relaxes and it kind of decreases that angle between the ampulla of the rectum and the anal canal. So if, you, if I draw a line here, that's through the anal canal here. And then you have the other angle here through the ampulla. So what happens is, is you have a more straightening of this area so that it allows stool to very easily pass through and making a straight exit way. And what happens is the parasympathetic efferent fibers in the pelvic splaining nerves, they stimulate a peristalsis to occur in the rectum and anal canal area. And then also the internal anal sphincter relaxes. That allows stool to move even um, move for more forward. And then intra-abdominal pressure, so in this abdominal area, that helps kind of press down gives in like an extra push and then finally when the external sphincter relaxes the stool is able to pass out and that concludes our discussion of the rectum and the anal canal